disasters, soil identification and classification, vegetation communities, endangered and extinct species, um, and river systems and coastal environments. And there was so much more. But amongst all these things, I found an interest in the coastal environment. And I got to know the coastal geographer and lecturer at uni called Dr. Rob Brander. He calls himself Dr. Rip, you may have heard of him. Uh, Rob focused his research on rip currents and beach safety. In the final year of my degree at uni, I worked with Rob as my supervisor during my research honours year. I had a pretty interesting topic, as Marissa mentioned. I, my project was looking at the educational benefits of watching Bondi Rescue. We, we were looking at how helpful the show was in teaching people about beach hazards and safety. This, of course, had lots of fun benefits to it. Uh, I spent three months watching Bondi Rescue. Um, I also got to meet lots of the lifeguards uh, from the show and talk to them about what they thought about the show. But I must admit, when I started my degree four years beforehand, I never would have seen myself doing a research project and publishing a research paper on a topic like that. It's quite unusual. After finishing my uh, last year of uni, I kept working at uni with my, my research supervisor, Rob. Um, and we, we were, I worked as a research assistant looking at beach safety. And we were, we were looking at the role of bystanders and members of the public um, and their role in saving people from, water, from the water and from drowning. Since then, since last year, um, I have, um, I've left uni and I'm working as an environmental science, scientist um, in the industry, so in the consulting industry, um, in a company called Douglas Partners. In this role, um, I have worked on projects including surface water and groundwater sampling, um, methane gas testing, soil and waste classification. So if you big, dig a big hole in the ground, you've got to do something with that dirt if you're going to build a building on it. So you've got to work out where that dirt can, can go. Um, I've done contaminated land projects, so lots of old landfill sites. And I've been working in this job for just over two months now, and I'm still learning new stuff every day, and I'm still going out on new projects, new sites, learning so many new skills. It really keeps you on your toes, um, but it's actually been really cool. So in my sh uh, short time as, um, working as an environmental scientist in the last couple of years, um, I've found that there's two things um, that have really stood out to me um, as to why I love environmental science. Um, the first thing is, um, I just realized I was meant to show you my slides from Douglas Pines. Anyway, there you go, that's what I do at the moment. Um, the first thing is, the reason why I love doing what I, um, doing what I do is I love how complex and broad environmental science is. Um, so there weren't heaps of people that actually studied my degree, um, but the people that were there, they specialized in a huge number of different areas. Um, so I have friends who are now botanists, I have friends who are biologists, uh, I have friends who are soil scientists, geologists, marine biologists, and ecologists. Um, one of my good friends actually, she studied animal behavior, and she looked at in one of her research projects um, at the impact of human visitor numbers on the stress levels of animals at Taronga Zoo. So she looked at whether there was an impact on the number of visitors that were visiting Taronga Zoo and whether it was stressing the animals out. Uh, it amazes me constantly how all the different aspects of um, the environment that I've learnt about and I've studied, they all, they all work together in different ways. Things are related and it's just fascinating seeing them all come together. Uh, the second reason that I love environmental science is I love how relevant and practical environmental science is. Uh, like every day I can see the impacts of what I'm doing on the people and the environment around me. Um, and it's making a positive difference uh, in them both. So whether it was studying um, coastal safety, you know, I was saving, I was trying to educate people so that they could be safe at the beach and ultimately save their life when they visited the beach or at the moment with the environmental science and working contaminated lands. We're cleaning up the environment so that people can live there and it's not destroying the habitats and the ecosystems there. Um, so anyway, doing all these things and studying environmental science also means that I also better appreciate going to cool places when I'm on holidays too. Um, so with that, 
Um, I think it's time to hand over to these guys. These guys are, have awesome stories um, as scientists and engineers in their fields. And I really want you guys to listen up and, um, and take note of their stories. It's not often that you get to hear stories like theirs. Um, and these guys are really impressive in their fields. Um, so I'm really excited to hear their stories and I hope you guys are too. Um, I just wanted to remind you with, with what Marissa said, there's going to be question time. So if th things come up when people are talking, write them down, jot them down or put them into the, um, into the app um, and you can ask them at the end. So I'm going to finish there and I'm going to hand back over to Marissa. Thank you. I told you she knows a lot about Bondo Rescue. Um, sticking with a the water theme, I'd love to invite a, um, Adrian. Uh, Harrison Gatt to come and speak to you next. She's an aquatic ecologist, and to find out more about that, please welcome Adrian. Excellent. All right. Yay, that's me. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, all right. Oh, my slide didn't work. That's fun. Um, so. Yeah, my name's Adrian Harrison Gatt, and currently I'm working for Sydney Water as an aquatic ecologist. Um, that's me on the right, and a colleague of mine on the left doing some intertidal rock platform surveys, so counting snails and algae, fun stuff like that. Um, so, a bit of background on where my science journey began. Um, pretty much from when I was a kid, like I spent a lot of time at the beach with my family. And I'd just go off and just pillage around in um, rock pools and look at everything that's in there and, you know, collect shells and stuff like that. I was always fascinated by it. Um, and fascinated by animals too. Like, we always had lots of pets at home. We had chickens, we had ducks. This was in suburbia in Sydney as well. Um, yeah, and I guess... I was lucky growing up in that um, both of my parents when I was young were in the field of STEM. So I've always grown up around technology and medical science. So that was kind of at the front of my mind. So when I'm going through high school, I thought, oh, maybe I'll be a paramedic. You know, I love it. It's so interesting, you know, helping people out and the scientific side of medicine, all that stuff sounds really cool. And then I changed my mind and I thought, oh, maybe I'll do engineering instead. And then it came around to picking my uni preferences. And then I decided to do a Bachelor of Science because I thought, well, it's all related, so I can decide later. So when I started my first year at UNSW doing a Bachelor of Science, I thought, excellent, I'm going to major in toxicology and pharmacology. And then in first year, I failed chemistry. <laughs> so I tried again in, second, uh, in the second semester of first year and failed again and thought, hmm, maybe this isn't for me. <laughs> so then I changed, and um, in second year science, you get to diversify what you're interested in. So first year, you know, you've got your basic, you know, biology, maths, chemistry, and that. But in second year, there were cool subjects like, you know, introduction to marine science and, um, you know, various ecology subjects and, um, like, just really, really cool courses, really interesting and very practical. So I thought, okay, I'm going to change around. And I changed and chopped and changed over the years. And then um, in third year, I think I went, okay, I'm going to do a double major in marine science and ecology because I love the terrestrial environment. Like I love birds and I love bird watching and bushwalking and all that kind of stuff. But I love the marine environment and the freshwater environment. So I covered everything, which was really fun. Sorry, I should have changed slides. So that's a photo of me and my colleagues out in the desert out at Fowler's Gap. It's pretty remote. We got to spend a week there looking at all the flora and fauna, which was pretty cool. And um, the boat up the top is the RV Southern Surveyor, which is now no longer around, but there's the RV Investigator. So I was lucky enough to be invited to go onto that ship onto two voyages. And so we were looking at plankton. And this was part of my um, honours year, even though it wasn't my project, some of my colleagues were working on it. And the lab that I was in went out to sea. Um, 
Yeah, so that was an amazing experience. You know, we spent seven days on one voyage out at sea doing like um, whale surveys and bird surveys and also plankton surveys and stuff like that. So we were offshore, so we actually got to see all these cool deep sea fish like viper fish and hatchet fish, all the ones that have like, you know, little dangly appendages and jaws that come out and stuff. And that was, it was really exciting to actually see them swimming around in our tanks. Um, so that was like, hugely inspiring and I'm really, really glad that I was able to do that. And at the bottom is a jar full of crabs and seaweed. <laughs> And that was my honours project. So I got to look at um, quite a lot of these jars, go through and identify all the animals in there and the um, amounts of those animals. So from that, I got to have like a, a community assemblage and assess the changes of that through time. Like we'd have, sorry, I should have said that the, the, the animals are actually from um, a lobster larvae survey project, which was um, uh, New South Wales Fisheries. So I got to, I was really lucky. I got to work at Fisheries when it was still at Cronulla. So we'd go snorkeling at lunchtime, which was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so um, basically for their lobster surveys, every year for lobster collection commercially, there's a, a set limit. So we don't over harvest the lobsters. Um, so they'll be there for the years to come. And basically with that monitoring, um, you'd get the baby, baby lobsters, very cute, tiny little see-through guys, and they'd live on these artificial seaweed structures. And there was also heaps of crabs and other things living on there. So we were trying to work out how is this in, because normally the index would be, you get this many lobsters here, then you can predict in a few years time when they're mature, then you're going to get this many lobsters, but it didn't work out. Anyway, very, very long story short, um, we didn't find any interaction. So what we, we thought we'd find, we didn't, but we ended up with more questions, which was really fascinating. Um, so I finished honours and um, I worked at a few different places for smaller periods of time. Um, so I worked at Office of Water in Wollongong, and that was really cool. We were looking at um, the aquatic invertebrates so invertebrates being small um, spineless animals um, around the Snowy River region. And like environmental protection is really, really important to me. I've always loved the environment. It's always been very, very important. So with doing that, I was able to apply that and know that we're actually like I'm making a difference and ensuring that the environment is protected by doing really top quality science. Um, I volunteered at the Australian Museum for a year and that was really, really awesome and I met some great people, some amazing scientists and that kind of directed me towards where I am now. So these guys on the screen, these are actually animals from um, my current workplace um, at Sydney Water. So these are collected off Malabar um, around the deep ocean outfalls. So we get these big grabs that go off a boat, go down to the seafloor grab a bunch of sediment, pull it up, and my lab goes through and see what's there. And then we can tell, is there you know, a negative impact of the deep ocean outfalls, which is where a lot of the treated wastewater from Sydney ends up. And it's great because there is no significant impact that we're observing. So it's really positive to know that we're doing the best that we can by calling the animals their right names and also analysing the data in the best possible way. So that's what we're, we're doing there. And um, this is one of our freshwater sites. So we go all over Sydney and sample the rivers and stuff like that. And it's a really cool job. It's really fantastic to be out in amongst it in nature. And a col colleague of mine was sitting at this site across where those rocks are and all these birds just came in around us and they were rare birds and it was just so cool. Yeah, awesome. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Adrienne. And Adrienne actually hit on a really great point. When you go to university or you think you'd like to go to university, you don't have to decide then and there what you're gonna do. 
we all have that friend who, when they were five, there was a star and they were going to be a doctor and that's what they're going to do. And then there's the 99.999% of the rest of us who are still probably trying to work it out. Sometimes it's just important to start. And you then, once you start, you'll find your way. Right, so just a quick reminder um, around uh, the Slido um, login. For those of you joining us online, you will have the opportunity to ask questions just like anyone else in our live audience here today. You need to log on to Slido, um, www.sli.do. Put in the code 3970. The way it works is you can put in a question, you can tell us your name and your school, that would be great, or you can do it anonymously. Something for you to think about with Slido, if you see a question that you like you, um, in there, you can like it. If you like that question, the, that question goes higher and higher up the, um, the food chain, and so Elise can see it's a popular question that lots of people want to ask. So if you see a question, you think, oh, well, that's what I was going to ask, I won't put anything in, just like it, and we'll do that that way. So we're going to have a quick activity break because um, it's important that we all keep moving. They tell us that sitting down is the new smoking. Now, I'm sure none of you smoke at all, um, but it's really important that we get up and do something. So um, we're going to play a little game, a really quick game called Fact or Factoid. So we all know what a fact is passed off as fact, but isn't actually true. So I'm going to get you all to stand up, please. The panel, you're more than welcome to play this game too. I am going to um, say something, and I want you to decide if you think it is a fact or a factoid. And you can let us know what your answer is. Put your hands on your head if you think it is a fact, and put your hands on your hips if you think it is a factoid. Are we ready? Okay. Goldfish only have a 10 second memory. Fact or factoid? Goldfish only have a 10 second memory. Fact or factoid? Okay, um, sit down. You all know how you voted. Grab a seat. So actually, goldfish um, can remember things for three or four months at a time. So recent research has shown that they know they can remember a lot more than we thought. So the next time someone says to you, oh, I forgot that I have a memory of a goldfish, you can say, well, you should have remembered that then because you would have had a memory of at least three or four months in there too. So bringing, um, moving away from our aquatic theme for a couple of speakers, I'd like to bring you back up onto land and just a little bit further back from where um, this museum is. Um, Sarah Reeves is our next speaker. She's from the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, otherwise known as MAS, and known to many people in Sydney as the Powerhouse Museum. She um, knows an awful lot about how galaxies grow, and she has a phenomenal job as a science curator at the museum. Please um, put a round of applause for Sarah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as Marissa said, I am now a science curator at the Powerhouse Museum, just down the road from here, but that is not actually where I started my career. I began as an astronomer. Uh, so, much like what uh, some of our past speakers have said and, and what Marissa was highlighting, I never really had an idea of what I wanted to do for a career. Um, at one stage I wanted to be a nurse, at one stage I wanted to be a pilot, but I never really had a fixed idea and something that I stuck to and a, a goal that I was aiming for. But I was always fascinated by science. Um, as a child, our dinner times were famous for uh, dinner time science lessons. Uh, if we went to the circus, we would come home and Dad would ask us questions about the physics of trapezes. Um, and things like that. So it was always a part of my childhood growing up. Um, 
I was always fascinated by astronomy. Um, who wouldn't be? You know, looking up at the stars, thinking about what's out, out there in the sky, I found absolutely fascinating. And I had posters uh, of galaxies and stars and things on my bedroom wall as a child uh, and a teenager. Uh, but I had no idea how to turn that into a career. And so I actually kind of completely forgot about that idea for a while. I came to be about your age. I was in year 11 and 12, picking my subjects for HSC, putting in my preferences for university courses, and I really still didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, and so, under my parents' encouragement, I took up a Bachelor of Science. They said, you've always been interested in science, you've always been fantastic at science, you always got good grades at it in school, and it's a very, uh, easy to, uh, it's, it's a subject that can kind of get you into all different kinds of careers. It's, it's very flexible in that way. So they said, do a Bachelor of Science. It doesn't matter if you don't know exactly what you want to be, just see where that leads you. And so I did. Uh, so I studied my Bachelor of Science at the University of Sydney uh, with the beautiful uh, sandstone quadrangle, which I loved uh, walking out to see every day. I studied physics and chemistry, um, and, and in terms of my subjects that I, that I wanted to study, I was pretty set on that right from the beginning. I'd done physics, chemistry, and biology in high school, decided biology was absolutely not for me. I, I loved the subject matter, could not do dissections. I had to leave the room every time that was happening, so that obviously wasn't gonna be a viable career for me. So I decided to do a double major in physics and chemistry, and that also involved doing quite a bit of mathematics. Uh, come to the kind of halfway through my third year, still didn't really know what I wanted to do for a career. So I went along to uh, an honors uh, information session. So this is a fourth year research project. And it turned out you could do research projects in astronomy and in particle physics. And there were all these cool projects to choose from that the professors had put forward. Uh, and so I spoke to a couple of people, spoke to a wonderful lady called Tara Murphy, who became my honors supervisor. And she had a project where I could study supernova remnants. So this is the remains of stars, which have very massive stars that have exploded. Um, and thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years later, as they expand out across space, they leave behind this shell that you can detect. Um, and so we were studying those um, using uh, this weird looking telescope here. It doesn't look much like a telescope. It's actually made from chicken wire. Um, but that's what I ended up doing for my honors project. After I graduated, um, a lot of people, professors and supervisors were encouraging me to do a PhD, but I was not sure about embarking on another uh, few years of study. It had been quite intense up until that point. So I did something different. I took a gap year. I worked as uh, a receptionist, um, which was a very boring job, but allowed me kind of the time and the space to think about what I really wanted to do next. It also gave me the opportunity to travel. And there's some pictures uh, there from my adventures in Africa during my year off. Um, but in the end, I, I did come back to do a PhD. Um, after a lot of thought, I'd actually been offered uh, a job at the Bureau of Meteorology, which was something I also found fascinating, but decided in the end I, I really wanted to pursue astronomy. So I did, um, and this is me uh, at some of the observatories that I uh, used. So I operated uh, these two different telescopes. Uh, you might recognize the one at the bottom there. That is uh, the Parkes telescope, most commonly known as the DISH from the movie starring Sam Neill. Um, and the photo in the middle at the bottom there is me actually standing on this giant 64 meter wide dish. Um, I also most often used uh, the telescope at the top. It's actually not one dish, but six. You can see five of them there. Uh, and there's six dishes, each 22 meters in size, spread out over six kilometers. Actually, five of them, the ones you see there, sit on a massive railway line. And you can actually drive them up and down this railway into different configurations depending on what you're trying to observe. Uh, and I actually had the experience of driving one of those antennas along the railway line. Um, and there's me playing on the railway at some point. Um, and, and on the left, at the controls of the telescope, um, it's really quite a phenomenal experience to be sitting at a telescope worth many millions of dollars and know that you are the sole person operating and, and in charge of that telescope. So what I was actually studying for my PhD, something that took me kind of four or five years to complete, 
I was studying galaxies, um, specifically trying to find out how galaxies grow and evolve. How you might know that we live in the Milky Way galaxy, a giant spiral galaxy made up of about 100, 000, uh, 100 billion stars and about 100,000 light years from side to side. It's enormous. And how do we grow something like that? Um, now, when we look up at the sky, when we think of galaxies, we think of stars. They're made up of stars. Uh, but actually, they're made up of a couple of other things as well. There's some dust there, and there's a bunch of hydrogen gas. Hydrogen is the simplest element in the universe, and it makes up a huge proportion of any galaxy. It's really important because it's the fuel from which the stars that we see form. It also feeds the supermassive black holes that we believe reside uh, at the center of most, if not all, galaxies. And from my point of view, it actually helps us to trace galaxy evolution and, and galaxy interactions. So at the bottom there, you can see uh, on, on the left is a photograph of three or four galaxies there seen through an optical telescope, one that collects the light that our eyes see. Uh, and on the right is an image through a radio telescope like these ones that I was using during my PhD. And it's a completely different picture. What look like these totally isolated galaxies in space are actually all interacting. And the colors there are the hydrogen gas showing you where it's most and, and least dense and, and mapping out where that structure is. And that helps us to figure out how galaxies are uh, interacting and colliding and, and gradually growing something the size of our galaxy. As part of my PhD, I also had the opportunity to travel a lot, uh, both around Australia and internationally, speaking at conferences about my research, uh, visiting and, and working with experts in my field who knew much more than I did and, and could really help me with my research. I spent uh, six weeks on, on two separate occasions in Germany. Uh, I spent some time in the Netherlands. Um, but at the end of that, uh, as much fun as I'd had, I'd really, really enjoyed my research and my PhD. I decided that I didn't want to pursue uh, a research career. It was quite competitive. There are not a lot of research jobs in astronomy. Um, but more importantly, I had discovered something that I loved. So during my studies to earn a bit of extra money, I had worked as a tour guide at Sydney Observatory, which is part of MAS. Um, so the powerhouse in Sydney Observatory and the museum's discovery center at Castle Hill, if you've heard of that, are all part of one museum. So I was already kind of working within the museum as a tour guide. I'd done a lot of teaching and tutoring throughout my uh, PhD. I'd spent two weeks at Uluru as astronomer in residence, and I decided I loved talking about astronomy, talking about science. Uh, and so an assistant curator's job came up at the museum just as I was finishing. And so that's what I'm doing now. I've been there just under two years. My job as a curator involves two main things, uh, designing and, and producing exhibitions uh, and finding things, cool stuff about science to acquire for the museum's collection to preserve essentially forever. Um, so some of the things I've worked on in the top at the middle, you can see this is a perfect silicon sphere made by CSIRO. It was actually my first acquisition as a curator. The top left uh, is Australia's first ever payload to go to the International Space Station, launched by a very small Sydney startup. Um, I have seen all of our cool exhibitions. There's photographs of me there um, in some of the ones that I've worked on. I met Brian Cox when he visited Sydney uh, last year or the year before. Um, and I also, as part of my work at the museum, attended an event in Canberra called Science Meets Parliament and had the opportunity to speak to politicians, very high profile politicians, about why science and science communication science communication is so important to all of us. So my work has changed a lot since uh, moving to a museum, but it is incredibly enjoyable um, and I'm having an absolute blast there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. We're gonna come down, back down to earth um, a little bit for our next speaker um, and enter the incredible world of data. Now, I know there are those of you in the audience who love maths um, and those who are probably not so sure about maths, um, but rest assured that data is becoming increasingly important um, on, um, to us on the world today. Um, I wear a Fitbit, 
for example. Um, it tells me how many steps I did, what my heart rate's doing, all those things. Five years ago, I would have no idea. Um, and now it generates all this data about me each day. And I am just one person. So if you multiply that across all the people on the planet, all the ways we're capturing data, we need professionals in that field to tell us what it is that we're seeing and to wrangle it or put it together. Um, so Paul, um, Paulina Judah uh, is an analytics professional and she's here to tell you more about her journey. Please welcome Paulina. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Paulina and I feel my story may be a bit different to uh, the previous ones because first of all, I'm not a researcher, I'm not an academic. I represent so-called uh, business world. I work for a company that is called SAS and it's an analytics company. So I'm really passionate about data and making um, value out of it. Uh, secondly, as you probably figured out already, I'm not a uh, Australian, uh, I come from Poland. Um, you've got a couple of pictures here. And I studied economics in Warsaw, which is the capital city. And Warsaw is a very cool city from science perspective, because first of all, there are a lot of um, research institutes that especially people interested in astronomy maybe may want to visit, like Copernicus Center. And it's also a home of the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. Who can recognize this lady on the picture? Yep. Uh, Marie Curie, she was not only the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, but also the first person to win two Nobel Prizes in two different disciplines. So I thought, you know, she may be a good inspiration for girls in science. Um, I'm not that successful yet. <laughs> I, I work in a um, so-called data science industry. And um, you would all agree that we live in a very data-rich world. So nearly everything and everyone today is generating incredible amount of data. And actually, it's been estimated that by the year 2025, um, an average person on the globe will um, connect or um, with, with any sort of devices uh, nearly 5,000 times per day. Quick maps, it means one interaction every second. So, you know, it's, it's crazy. And organizations and companies, they understand that, that this data is everywhere just waiting to be analyzed and, and they want to understand uh, the patterns. They want to basically get some value out of it in order to make, uh, transform this world of data into the world of intelligence. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do on my everyday basis at, at my work. And you yourself um, were are actually participating in this data economy. Um, think of your last 24 hours. Um, well, some of us traveled here today, maybe not necessarily by plane, but you know, by bus or car. And analytics companies like SaaS, um, for instance, try to predict which customers, which passengers may be late at gate at the airport or optimize transportation routes of city buses. Um, then when you go on holidays, um, hotels and um, websites like Airbnb, they use clever algorithms to estimate the price of the room, uh, depending on the demand, depending on the time of the year, and so on and so forth. Then who has made a pay purchase in the last 24 hours? Um, yeah, so whenever you, you make any transactions, banks or financial institutions, they scan your transactions and whenever something goes wrong, there is a, let's say, the risk of fraud, something dodgy is going on, they would block your credit card, they would block your account. But again, there is a machine learning and algorithms working in the background in near real time. And um, you all use mobile phones, um, smartphones actually at this very moment. Um, so manufacturers, they use analytics too. Uh, for instance, for their quality control processes. They want to make sure that products that they are launching to the market are, you know, that they work well. Um, and we also work with governments, whether it's a federal or state government. So for instance, in New Zealand, uh, analytics is used uh, to uh, identify children at risk of abuse. It's a very serious topic, but, you know, because of giving social workers and uh, public sector workers right information in the right time, they can actually go to the, you know, particular communities and families and uh, help those people. And 
We also work with, um, um, sorry, non-for-profit organizations. Oh, wrong, sorry. Well, we also work for uh, non-for-profit organizations like uh, UNICEF or, um, oh, sorry, something good. Um, like UNICEF, like um, uh, in Australia, Black Dog Institute that uh, does research around depression and, um, and helps people with um, um, mental diseases, uh, but also uh, environmental institutes that um, analyze uh, images and patterns of animals and, and they try to slow the decrease of endangered species. So whatever you want to do, whether you want to um, predict something, uh, forecast maybe demand for products, maybe you want to work on a, a water quality, improve the quality of air, um, or you want to delight your customers, you want to um, give them the right products at the right time, maybe you want to invent and innovate, you know, um, work on new services, then you always need to start with the data. And the data is everywhere and um, just, um, um, I truly believe that the data without analytics is value not yet realized. So, um, so it's very important to collect all those information and make some meaning and, and understanding out of it. And um, there is the next slide. This is my very proud picture of um, the Everest Base Camp. Um, I'm a big fan of climbing and hiking and basically everything mountain related. And uh, I went there a couple of months to, to Nepal. And most of you probably know that this country was highly affected by the earthquake a couple of years ago. And a lot of people died and a lot of people needed help. And now I want to show you um, how uh, analytics actually and data analysis uh, helped uh, with this relief efforts and, and uh, how big impact uh, it makes on actually everyday lives. So let me play a quick video now. Um, if I find the... Uh, I cannot see Chrome here, but... Sorry for that. Uh, I can, yeah, but I can't see the mouse. Oh yeah, this. Right. Okay. Yep. Here you go. At the onset of a large-scale disaster, you have a large number of humanitarian organizations that turn up. Information and any data becomes extremely valuable. Everyone is keen to make sure that the most vulnerable are provided with service. Being able to leverage the data to its fullest extent possible is helping us to better target our responses on the ground. We were thinking of covering first the insight you had sent us an email on. That might be interesting. So I put all of the sector support variables up here. Yeah, we can see it. And so when we look at the 66 camps, Kathmandu has hardly any girls under the age of one. This morning, we were looking at protection concerns in the sites and which age groups are more vulnerable. Okay, and that brings us to these eight camps here. Out of the 400 some odd females, almost half of them fall under the age of five. We want to be the one to flag issues to other agencies to make sure that these people are on their radars. Because what we also track is where people are coming from and how we can support them to return. Okay. 
With mobile data collection devices, we can basically assess the information in the morning, analyze it in the afternoon, and disseminate it in the evening. Philippines have four values. Myanmar have three. Nepal have two. Getting people home depends on timely actions. SaaS helped us to start thinking about predictive analytics and using our data in anticipating what is coming next. That's very powerful. Becoming more efficient in humanitarian relief is something that excites me personally. So we're just having a few technical issues at the moment. Um, for those of you who can uh, hear some drilling and things going on, uh, we are proof that we will work under any conditions, any environments, not just at the bottom of the ocean, um, but also um, during building construction. We are, have razor sharp focus and we're going to have a phenomenal day. I just, before we move on to our next speaker, I just wanted to talk to you about the importance of today and why it's so exciting for us to be working with the um, Australian National Maritime Museum and all these wonderful speakers to have the opportunity to get in front of you. So the activity I'm going to ask you to do is a little bit physical and we know that when we do something a little bit physical we need to warm up. So can I get you all to stand up please? If you are tuning in to us online, you are more than welcome to do this as well. Stand up in your classroom. Now, you need to make a bit of room because I don't want you to hit the person next to you. Now, I want you to swing your arms out vertically. Go on, swing your arms out vertically. Go on, swing it out vertically. That's it, we're just gonna warm up. Swing your arms out vertically, don't hit anywhere. Now, did anyone notice anything? One, there's no space. True. What I said was swing your arms vertically. What you did was swing your arms out horizontally. Now, grab a seat. So that is actually a great party trick, um, good one to crack out um, during the holidays um, on your parents. Um, that is the reaction that you had is exactly the same reaction that I have seen with groups of phenomenal scientists, um, people from business, uh, industry leaders, they all do the same thing. So you can see from that really simple exercise that what you see is extremely important. We, you can read a lot about um, uh, all the things that you can do as a human being, but until you see them, it's hard to imagine yourself in that space. And what we see is vitally important to how we um, interact with that. Now, our next speaker, and I knew I could do that because our next speaker is, uh, has wonderful high energy, Erin uh, Prince. She is currently a student. So she's a great person to ask about what is life at university like um, at the moment. Uh, she is majoring in pharmacology and also um, Japanese. So would you please welcome Erin Prince, who is a woman on a mission to improve global health. So I'm just going to quickly give you a disclaimer that I literally did grow up on a sporting field. So I'm used to really motivational, inspirational, team building speeches from coaches and captains and parents. So this may come across more as a call to the, to the arms of science than really my own personal history. Um, but we'll see how we go. So our world is constantly changing. Every day that you wake up, your phone has updated. Our knowledge of current DNA, molecules, chemical interactions, all updated. Every day we wake up, there are more people who are alive on this planet. So that's more people who can contribute to our global community, but more people who need access to water, medicine, food in order to survive. So, I woke up one morning and thought, 
how can I be a part of all of this? There's a few options. I could watch the world change. I could comment on how the world changed or I could write about how the world is changing or I could be part of the change. And it was this thought that led me to pursue a degree in science. So I'm currently doing a science and arts degree at the University of New South Wales. I major in pharmacology, which is a branch of medical science looking at the design, innovation, manipulation of drugs for our own better improvement of health, as well as doing Japanese and Asian studies. I'm really hoping that today gives you a glimpse in the fact that science underpins so much of how the world works, but most importantly, that women have always belonged to science, technology, engineering and mathematics fields. From people like Marie Curie to our current Australian of the Year, Professor Michelle Simmons. Women and the things that women have thought about have always contributed to these fields. So you should feel like you can pursue a career and you can use your knowledge to have your STEM skills and have a career in STEM. So unlike most of your other um, people that you've heard from today, I'm still a baby scientist. Um, I'm still at university, I've still got my training wheels on and I'm still working out how me and my interests in the science world are going to have an impact on our global community. What is exciting though is that I still get to go along to UNSW every day and sit and listen to people who are specialists in their field. These are lecturers and professors and postgraduate students who are dedicating their whole career to trying to change how we see a problem, how we tackle a situation and to contribute to our knowledge of how the world works. It can be pretty mind boggling sitting there in their lectures hearing what they have to say. I personally decided to hop into a medical science field because I find the body and how much has to work together on such an intricate level for us to work incredibly interesting. I also find it fathomable and tangible. I think that galaxies and astronomy is incredible. I think the physics is, is so crazy exciting, but I don't understand it because I can't feel it and I can't work it out. So for me, because I've twitched an example of like a cellular electrical pulse going through my body, or I've buckled over in pain from lactic acid having ran way too hard on the field, it's like I understand it because I felt it and I know what it's like for these things to occur. So for me, that makes me want to know more about what the medical sciences have to offer. As a student in high school, it was days like today that made me want to pursue that degree in science because you meet people and you hear from people that think about the world in a bit of a different way to what you've seen before. You also realise that they do make great contributions to how our world works and they can have a whole range of different careers. It was then the teachers that you've come with today and the ones you'll come across who will help you see that you can have a life in science and that there are things and interesting questions to ask. It was the teachers who let me compare um, 100 metre sprint times to the long jump length required for optimum long jump length, or who showed me videos about uh, the creation of artificial bones and skin that made me really want to find out more about this science world and got me hooked about science. My science degree has already taken me around the world, which um, being a fourth year uni student is pretty exciting. I've already got to travel to India and travel to Singapore. In India, I got to work with a team of environmental engineers to come up with a solution to the water quality problem of a village in the far south of India called Ankanahali. We worked day in, day out, with cows out the window, goats walking along the front of the house, with no running water, no electricity, and with monkeys who ran across the roof and stole your undies. But what we were doing is trying to find a way to improve the livelihood of the people in this village. By figuring out a water quality solution for them, they got to go to work. They got to go to school. And so they had a better future than they previously thought they would. So it was through this experience that I realised that my science could have 
an impact on someone's life and make it better, thereby inspiring me to try harder and do better in my science degree. I think there are two myths about science and being a scientist that we really need to crack. The first is that a lot of people seem to think that if you're a scientist, that's all you are. And the second is that you have to be some incredibly smart, gifted mind in order to have and be able to contribute to science. Both of these are not true. Me personally, as a science student, still get to study things like Japanese language, Asian politics, food and culture. On the weekend, I go and cruise around um, playing sport for the uni, most importantly, AFL footy and throwing a discus on the weekend. I get to go to the beach and cafes with my friends. I still get to go traveling and I get to see the world and what it has to offer. So by no means doing science means you are blocked off from the rest of the world. The people that have made the most giant leaps in science are, are very special minds, but they're also just people. They're people who had to sleep, people that had to eat, people that had to exist in some way, but they just decided to have inquisition and ask questions and make a contribution to something that they were interested in. So I don't think we as women should ever think we're not smart enough to be able to contribute to this science world. As I come towards the end of my science degree, my new challenge is trying to work out how my passions and interests and my knowledge of STEM and the pharmacology and disease knowledge can all come together in order to make a positive impact on our globe. I think for me, it'll be uh, pursuing someone like the World Health Organization or a job with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. This may bring together all my science knowledge and mean that I'm able to contribute to a better future. I think from today, you should take away a few lessons that science is very special, science is fun, and that science does have a lot of good to do in our world. So I think our challenge as like a sisterhood of women trying to fight for equality is that within STEM and within the world in general, we should work for a better future together. Thanks guys. Thank you so much, Erin. Our next speaker is Dr. Lisa Williams, who is a social psychologist. Um, much of Lisa's research focuses on the positive um, emotions that you feel when you interact with each other. That's why some of the social things we've been doing today are so important to enjoying the day. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Lisa Williams. All right. So um, I'm really delighted to be here to talk to you guys today. Um, as uh, Marissa said, I am a social psychologist. So I'm currently a senior lecturer at UNSW. I'm an academic. What that means is I get to teach and do research and have a career in science. Now you might think just a second ago, she said she's a, she's a psychologist. Psychology is in science. Turns out that's a big stereotype. Psychology is a science. Psychology is the scientific study of mind, brain, and behavior. Now I'm a social psychologist, so I do science about the way the mind, brain, and behavior change according to social situations. So that fun little party trick about the arms, I know the psychological processes that led to that. We call that conformity. And social psychologists have been studying this for decades. So as a scientist in this field um, of social psychology, I basically get to ask questions and answer them about why we all do the funny things we do every day when we interact with other people. But I've had a bit of a long path, and I think some of my um, story here about how I got to be a social psychologist will echo a lot of what you've heard. So let's see. Um, I went to school, uh, high school in Maui, Hawaii, um, which is where I grew up. This lovely campus um, 
I was pretty interested in science, but also pretty interested in other non-science topics like English and foreign language. In the US, you can take high school classes that give you college credit. By my senior year, I had done six of these, and half of them were in science, but the other half weren't. I really had pretty equal interests. And when I reflect back on why that was, I think it's because my teachers at this high school really emphasized that learning is more about the process and the passion than what you're studying. And if you find learning fun, then you can study whatever you want. It did turn out I had one particular interest, and this is where the echoes are pretty similar. I had a passion for environmental activism. So much that my, I hate to admit this, uh, my nickname, if you will, in high school was Nature Girl. Uh, I'd say people probably were teasing me when they said that rather than being terribly nice, but I really wanted to go out and save the world. Um, so when I was thinking about university, I thought, aha, I know how to save the world. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do environmental science, and then I'm going to go to law school, and I'm going to be an environmental lawyer. This is the thing for me. So I went out. I applied for university and I chose to go to Lewis and Clark College, which is on the west coast of the US. And somewhere between I'm going to go to Lewis and Clark College and showing up on the first day, my conviction that environmental law for me was for me started to get a bit shaky. I can't say why. But I showed up and I thought, OK, well, I'm enrolled in this major program. I have to take first year biology, walked into that course. And within a couple of weeks, I knew it wasn't going to happen. There was a nail on the coffin. I could not do four years of biology. So what are you going to do? Well, it turns out at Lewis and Clark College, they encourage you to take a heap of different courses in your first year. And I happened to be taking psychology. So I thought, well, I find this stuff pretty interesting. By my second year, I was invited into a research lab, and I started learning about what it is to do the science of psychology, what it is to ask questions about social psychology. Why do we behave this way when one thing happens and another way when another thing happens? OK, so like there's a career in asking the questions we all ask every day. That's pretty cool. And I caught the bug. I knew that what I wanted to do was to be an academic in psychology. I wanted to be able to teach and do research. So the question then was, what degree do I need to do that? Well, turns out you need a PhD. So I went off to Boston on the east coast of the US, and I got a PhD in social psychology. And that's really where my interest about emotion grew. So a lot of us think or have been told that we have emotions and a lot of times we have to regulate them. So when we're angry, we need to avoid showing that we're angry. Um, but it turns out that most psychologists think that emotions can be really helpful. And when I started to look into it, it turns out we don't know a lot about what our positive emotions do for us. So Marissa mentioned that a lot of my work asks questions about positive emotions. Turned out no one had ever asked a question about what the emotion pride does for us. So pride is the emotion you might feel when you get a top mark on an exam or hit a goal on the field. Well, I helped discover the fact that pride actually helps motivate us. It makes us work harder at studying or harder at training at our sports um, skills. So I got my PhD, and then I came down here to UNSW, where I'm able to really do my dream job. Right? I'm able to teach and do research in psychology every day. So I ask questions about uh, the way that we interact and our emotions. So for instance, right now, one of my big projects is asking how emotions really impact romantic relationships. So when you're hanging out with your partner, how do the emotions that you're feeling affect the emotions that your partner's feeling, and vice versa? So that's some good, fun research I get to do with my students. I also get to teach, and my hope here when I teach is to inspire a passion for science just like I had a passion for science inspired in me when I was a student. When I actually got to uni and went, eh, my career plan has totally gone bust, what do I do? So I like to think that I'm able to show students that science is a career, it's got several aspects. And a final bit of what I do in my career is to work on days like this to help increase uh, the feeling that women can do science, technology, engineering, and math. So as a social psychologist, part of what I study is stereotypes. That is beliefs about people and what they can do. Turns out there's a pretty strong stereotype that STEM is for men. But social psychology has shown that there are a lot of things, like days today, that start to break down those stereotypes. 
And women can be just scientists just as well as men can. So it turns out Marie Curie is a pretty uh, popular uh, person today. Um, so I don't need to tell you that she was a Nobel Prize awardee or uh, that she won two Nobel Prizes. She's actually the only person ever to win two Nobel Prizes in separate disciplines, right? So super fantastic. Now, she's quoted as saying, this thing really sums up my attitudes towards science. She said, be curious about people and more curious about ideas. On that first point, I think we could probably call Marie Curie a social psychologist. Being curious about people is exactly what I get to do every day. And I'm also curious about ideas. I like to ask questions about the ideas that we have about the world in which we live and to actually grow our knowledge about that. And the way I like to grow that knowledge is to use science. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Can we please have a massive round of applause for our speakers? And in fact, I think we can do better than just a round of applause. Um, but we will have a quick round of applause also for your teachers online and here today. They filled in the forms. They um, submitted all the paperwork that goes into bringing to you, you to something like this today. Um, and for those of you listening in online, they've probably had to tweak a timetable to make sure that you can um, listen in. So thank you so much for that. But rather than just, just a quick uh, round of applause, we are at the Maritime Museum, so I think we can have a bit of a maritime wave. So I would like to start from this end of the room over here. I'm looking at you, the gentleman in the lovely suit to leave that there, and we're going to move it all the way across the room. So a maritime wave, formerly known as the Mexican wave. <laughs> yes, exactly. Girl in the back, you got that right. Um, you can explain to everyone else. So formerly known as the Mexican wave is where everyone stands on one side of the room, stands up, and then sits down, and you need to follow suit. So after three, one, two, three. And, and this way, from here to there, go. <laughs> You're all really awesome. Hey, we do have one last speaker um, today. Um, we're delighted that at UNSW, um, we are home to the current Australian of the Year, who is a quantum physicist. So here is a video from Michelle Simmons. So thank you for your patience. We're having a slight technical hitch here. Um, it is actually the perfect example um, that you have um, of the world changing around us. Um, as the speakers have been speaking today, the museum has literally been changing around their ears, and that's the noise and the drilling that you can hear in the background. Um, and as scientists and as people, we need to learn to adapt. So just if you bear with us, thank you for your patience. very lucky I had a very loving close family and you know every weekend I would sit and watch my brother and father play chess and after a few years I suddenly decided I wanted to have a go so the end of the game when my my brother finished I asked my dad dad can I have a go and he was really kind of surprised he didn't expect me to ask and he clearly didn't expect that I'd know how to play but after about 20 minutes I actually checkmated him he was totally surprised you know he realized that he had underestimated it and from that moment onwards it really made me think wow there must be other things in life that people don't expect that I can do and I wonder what they are when most of us think of the world around us we think of what physicists call the classical world the world of the big where the moon goes around the earth where a ball will bounce back off a wall but some scientists imagine the world of the incredibly small the quantum world a bizarre place where maybe one particle can be in 
two places at once, where quantum computers, if we can build them, will work at amazing speeds. The advances that Michelle and her team have already made, combined with her vision, her leadership, her intellect and her drive, mean that Australia is placed at the forefront of the race to build a prototype quantum computer in silicon. She's unbelievably excited about what the quantum world will hold. I think every, every individual has to explore the boundaries of who they are. And I think every time you step outside of, you know, the kind of comfort zone of what your life has been to date, you'll find something phenomenally rewarding there. Problems that today would take thousands of years for our computers to solve will take minutes. The world is watching Michelle and her team in Sydney. And it's not just the computing world, it's the finance world, it's the health world, it's the environmental sector. This has enormous consequences for all of us. To be able to create a technology that's useful for humanity, to be able to create a computer that can actually help us solve diseases, optimise weather patterns, have all these applications to make the world a better place and understand the world, that's what really drives me. Fundamentally, she is a brave person. She dares to do things where others might be more cautious. When I shut my eyes, I look at the world in a completely different way, and I imagine that I'm sitting there with the atoms that we're putting in place and realizing that every atom matters. The ability to code information in quantum states and transmit it securely is going to change the world. What inspires me about the work of people like Michelle is it's so complicated, it's so cutting edge, it's so deep and profound, but it goes to an incredibly basic question. I think one of the essences of being human is to look at the world around you and go, what is stuff? What is stuff made of? And that's essentially what quantum physics, quantum mechanics, the quantum world is all about. The very cutting edge of understanding stuff. What a noble and dignified thing to spend your life working on. Hello everyone. I hope you've had a fabulous day at the annual Women's Science Symposium. I know you've got to see a lot of young girls and a lot of young researchers going through the beginnings of their career across lots of different walks of life and I hope you've enjoyed that. Going forwards, I guess life is up to you. It's your own life, you create your own challenges. One of the things that I've seen is that it's very difficult to plan your life based around what your parents did, or indeed what your parents did, based on what their parents did. Times are changing too fast and you've got to chart your own path. It's a very exciting time for you to do that. But to succeed, you've got to find the things that you love. You've got to look at all the challenges that are challenges for you. And when you choose your career, one of the great things to do is to pick up all the skills in life that are going to help you to get to where you want to go. One of the great things about being a scientist is there's many different types of skills, whether it's learning maths or coding, statistics, creating things, building things, being the creators rather than users of technology. I think that's critical. Throughout my life, I've had four mantras that have helped me along. Do what's hard, take risks, place high expectations on yourself, and do something that matters. Throughout my career, that's helped me at any point to chart my own path, and I encourage you to come up with whatever mentors work for you. It's a very exciting time to be a scientist. It opens your life, it opens all the pathways ahead of you. It doesn't narrow you down. So I encourage you, find your own path and go for it. It's a good reminder to do what you love, um, look up, look out, and remember you are far more capable than you think. Thank you. To those of you, to those of you listening um, online, we will be back online at 1.15.